Folks, we are here. Dr. James, Dr. Mike, it's the bi-weekly Q&A. We're here to answer your fucking questions. Dr. Mike, how's it going? Woo! Woo! I'm starving to death. Ooh. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm fine, but cutting is real and it's cool because results are happening. So Yahoo. Cutting is definitely a bummer. <laughs> One of those like good benefits, high costs. Yeah. I know uh, our viewers and listeners, if you, if, if you notice me looking distracted, it's because my wife is shooting fucking like cannonball size rounds in the backyard. So every now and again, it's like the house shakes because they're shooting off some big ordnance in our backyard. So apologies if I appear distracted. Sweet. <laughs> well, before you get shot to death in an accidental quote unquote shooting, shall we? Yes, let's do it. Got to get this All done right. before I get shot. Excellent. Daniel Brown is uh, good enough on writing long books that turn into movies. And he's here to ask us a question. Downtown Daniel Brown. He asks, is there really such a thing as training to build muscle density? Since I've started my fitness journey, I've definitely gained muscle, but I feel uh, like I lack real muscle thickness. Interested to hear your thoughts, Docs. Love the content as always. So my answer to this is we're not 100% sure. Uh, We know everything there is to know in this capacity about muscle growth and gain, and there could be something called muscle density that we're just not aware of from a research perspective and a theoretical perspective. But that, I would say, is a probably less than a 5% chance. And more than 95% chance is that the idea of muscle density it just makes no goddamn sense. Muscle is muscle. You build it. There it is. Sometimes you can have muscle that's a little bit more sarcoplasmic in nature, some that's a little bit more myofibrillar. I don't really know what that means as far as density. I don't know the difference in actual measure density between those two. But muscle converts back and forth between more myofibrillar and more sarcoplasmic. It's not a very difficult thing to do. So I don't think muscle density is a thing. I think it's mostly like genetics, muscle size, and the kind of drugs you're on to make your muscles look a little bit different cosmetically. And that's about it. So just focus on building muscle size, getting leaner, repeating the process, and eventually people will call you dense, James. Yeah, absolutely. As far as I know, there's not really anything to that. And I think a lot of it is just like a lot of people just wear and I, I use that term lightly, but like people just look different depending on how they gain. Some people will have more thickness, like front to back. Some people just have different looks and that kind of, you might look at somebody and be like, yeah, that's some fucking dense. That's a dense deltoid right there, bro. And it's just like, it's just somebody who looks cool. You know, it's kind of hard to say. Yeah. And as Mike said, I don't really feel like, even if it was a thing, I don't feel like the, the outcomes of that would be any different than training to build regular muscle mass. I would actually argue that if it was a thing, it would be more pertinent to athletics than it would be bodybuilding just because then you can deal with things like strength to body weight ratios. And that becomes yes. more important. So even if it was a thing, I think it's less important for physique than it is for sports. So I would just not bust with it too much. Yeah. It's probably not a thing. Next up is Henrik Anderson, who in his usual glory spares no expense of making a nice, Good long question for us. That's always highly upvoted, Henrik. You are the f- uh, you are really well loved by our followers and our subscribers. So yeah, no kidding. Henrik asks, years. yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, he says you recommend a post workout meal consisting of little to no fats and fast digesting carbs for individuals who do not train twice a day and every muscle has at least forty eight hours of rest between each session. Would you still recommend a fast digesting post workout? If so, could you put a number as to how much more beneficial it is? is it really going to make a big difference in the long run? So the answer to that is no, probably wouldn't recommend that. And it would be marginally beneficial by like less than a percent um, over the long run. And he says, for context, I tend to lean to a slow digesting uh, post-workout meals due to hunger management and general lifestyle. That's Those are great choices. I'm wondering how big of a difference changing my post-workout would make, uh, almost none. And possibly because you're managing hunger better and general lifestyle is better than it would actually make you have more gains if you did the slower digesting stuff. So uh, our fast adjusting stuff is uh, not a post-workout meal recommendation carte blanche. It is a post-workout meal recommendation in a specific context. And if you would like more about the context, the Renaissance Diet 2.0 book is where to go for that. James? Booyah. Yeah. Just for some context, because I feel like this comes up a lot. And um, Mike and I fall privy to this problem when we were graduate students, because if you look at some of the early research on nutrient timing, it would have you believe that this was like a godsend to the earth. Like God was like, you know what? War, famine, destruction, like natural resources. 
don't worry about that. High glycemic carbs fixes everything. Everyone's good, solves all the problems of the world. So it looked really promising kind of in like the 2000s era, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It looked really good. And we everyone thought like, God damn, this nutrient timing stuff, like getting those fast glycemic carbs, that's it just fixes everything. It makes everyone so much better. You know, fast forward to 2021, the current year, and the magnitude of the effects on that just really didn't pan out the way we thought that they would. And so that's kind of where a lot of this disconnect comes from, where it's very clear that there is an effect, right? No doubt that there is an effect that can be elicited from these kind of nutrient timing type strategies. What we found in the long run is that the magnitude of those effects just aren't very powerful and probably are only important in a very narrow context of circumstances. So it's not really worth fussing over too much, especially, I think this came up on our last Q&A. If you're, if you don't notice any, like if you don't have any noticeable um, problems of recovery or your performance is dropping in weird ways, like you don't have to worry about it. You can just keep doing whatever you're doing. Well, uh, off that perfect tangent to next question asker just below Daniel Brown is a little sugar. All right. So if this, if this is a Meshuga reference, you're the man. And I will, I will yeah. go back and listen to chaos fear in your honor later today. Uh -huh. Or it's like a shitty rapper name. Oh, oh. who knows, right? Oh. Who knows? How could you? He says, say after lifting for seven years, I have achieved and I'm content with 80% of my natural potential. How would I go about transitioning to a lifelong maintenance phase? How would I find out if the maintenance volume I choose is too low without losing gains in the process? Thanks. Well, so by getting a little bit of a pump, a little bit of a disruption, soreness, et cetera, you can nearly guarantee that you won't lose any gains because if your training feels super, super easy, then maybe it's too, too much. But if it feels like, oh, like I'm getting into decent stimulus, then it's probably good enough. Here's the really cool thing. If you gain, if you lose gains in the process, you can always train a little bit higher than maintenance and get them right back within a few weeks. So it's, it's really not a problem at all. Absolutely. Um, it's like, it's like trying to like target shoot and sight your rifle and try to hit the bullseye, but you're like, what can I do to prevent any bullets being fired outside of that range? Like, well, that's actually just how you sight it is. Some go above, some go below. It's not a big deal. So like there's, you can, you can just recite your guns, easy fix. You can just regain the muscle. No problem. You don't lose muscle permanently. And, uh, how would you go about transitioning to lifelong maintenance phase is you would just start training at maintenance volumes, frequencies, and intensities. Those are specified and are uh, scientific principles of hypertrophy training book. I've got uh, a few videos on um, the RP strength or the Rouse House position YouTube about maintenance, but generally speaking, you stick mostly to compound movements because they allow super high efficiency. You drop your volume by something like one half to two, one half to one third of your typical volume when you're trying to gain muscle probably go down to one third and see if you're maintained. And if you maintain, then you stay there. And if you lose some size, then you increase your volume a little bit, get it back and go from there. And there's a little bit of auto-regulation that has to happen, but that's really kind of the answer. And I would say training three to four days a week for an hour at a time, uh, anywhere between two and four, <laughs> maybe two and five uh, fats per muscle group per session is probably good enough for most people. So I would start there, James. Yeah, that was a really good suggestion. So you could also go about it a slightly different way, depending on if you if you like to train hard or not. So uh, Dr. Mike gave it from like, if you're trying to reduce the amount of time that you spend in the gym and, and so you can have a more fulfilling lifestyle, that's absolutely the way to go. If you like training and it's something that you're going to do anyway, then at that point, you really just switch the diet stuff around and just say, I'm not going to do these dedicated mass or cut phases. I'm mostly going to eat kind of what, what I normally would eat and lock that in for the long term. And then if you want to train hard and you just enjoy doing that, you're not going to see as much tangible progress in the short term, um, but you'll still make marginal gains in strength over time. And you'll still see some progress there, uh, but you won't really have to fuss nearly as much with the diet stuff, which is a huge life improvement. And you can do as much or as little training as you want. And if you want to train a little bit more, great. And if you want to do more of like the maintenance volume training, like Mike described, that's fine too. Anywhere in that range, you're good to go. And at that point, it's more of an issue of like, how much time do you want to spend doing food prep and body weight and calorie tracking, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Next up, just below Milo Wolf there is Fabio Dimebag. That sounds like, uh, so... When I see Dimebag, my really brain either goes to dealer. Weed Joke or Dimebag Daryl Pantera reference. We've got two heavy yeah. potential heavy Jeez. metal references here. Yeah, uh, it's either heavy metal or just total shit. Yeah. 
All right. He says at Dr. Mike Fabio, unfortunately the at hashtags don't work on YouTube. I'm sure you knew that. Uh, Dr. Mike, with all the deaths in bodybuilding, do you have any longevity safeguards? Do you have a set time when you will stop lasting? So yes, I do. Um, in my early to mid forties is my absolute cutoff. Unless I take care of some professional goals in the sport of bodybuilding that I have set for myself, which will remain private to me for the time being. Um, once I hit those goals, I'll probably retire shortly thereafter. Um, and it's basically goals of how kind of how I want to look on stage. Um, you know, I could always retire sooner if the docs say I'm going to die soon. Uh, but probably in my uh, early to mid forties is when I stop blasting, you don't make good gains after that anyway. And I'll probably uh, get down to somewhere between 180 to 200 pounds. And then later probably 160 to 180 and be much smaller. It'll feel much better. Well, I will say, so with all the deaths in bodybuilding, um, news headlines are a very, very poor way to understand the world from a statistical perspective. We actually don't know if there are more deaths in bodybuilding this year than last year or any year before, because we don't collect formal statistics. At least we're not aware of them right now. I'm not. So it's just a couple of high profile deaths. Don't say anything about the base rates. Most bodybuilders that die aren't famous. And maybe there are years where tons of national level guys die. And you just never hear about it. So uh, I would say that with all the deaths in bodybuilding, it's not a consideration of mine at all. It's just not clear to me that it was even a trend. Uh, I had longevity standards before, and I plan on implementing them. And, and actually, during this time of blasting, so to speak, I still am very intelligent and take the right supplements and safeguards and blood work and everything to make sure that I'm not just like, well, while the getting's good, I'm just going to try to kill myself. But as soon as I'm done, then I back off, still trying to do it with some definitely a lot of moderation and intelligence. So that's what it is. Did I miss anything there, James? Does that sound like no, an answer to you? I think that was a great answer. Uh, the only thing I think with like, especially this year is I feel like the ones that happened this year were also like very sudden and unexpected. And that's why I feel like they have maybe carried more weight than yeah. they typically have. The guys didn't look terrible for weeks before or months before. And you're like, that guy's going to die. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no indications that they were sick, at least as far as I knew. Um, so it was just kind of like, that guy's dead now. And we're all like, what? Are you serious? So I think that's kind of what happened in this year in particular. Um, but like Mike said, you know, it does happen. I mean, in all sports, all sports and activities take a toll on your life. Like if you played rugby for 20 years, like you can imagine that you're going to die sooner than other people in your family <laughs> that yeah. didn't play rugby. Like it's just part of, it's part of the, the deal, you know? Yeah. And we know, we know steroids are bad for your health and all the other drugs are bad for your health. So we don't have to debate that. But also another thing is like, are we so clear? We know the proximate causes for all these deaths, you know, uh, with all very, very due respect. And I do mean that, um, you know, one of the recent deaths was uh, tragically Sean Roden. And Sean Roden is a 300 pound, 46 year old Caribbean descent of black man. Okay. Like his chances of having a cardiac event are actually quite high anyway. Uh, because he was a bodybuilder under drugs, it certainly raises the chances, the drugs part, the fact that he was lean most of his life drops the chances and actually bring him down to just about statistical average of black man that weighs 300 pounds at his age 46. You are African-American because there's differences between the races. It's bad to be 300 pounds at age 46 for any race, but a, uh, a male of African descent coming to the doctor and at age 46 presenting at somewhere between 250 and 300 pounds, doc's not going to have anything good to tell you as far as your, your longevity, uh, like it's just, it, period. So people say, oh, like it was the drugs, like all, almost certainly they contributed. We, we really don't know how much and how things would have been different. And again, like Mike said, you can't use anecdotes because there's plenty of people who use drugs less intelligently that don't die that you never hear about and vice versa. So, you know, it's just- Ronnie like, Coleman's still alive. So. Yeah. God, he's, he's broken. He used a lot of drugs for a long time, but still not dead. So, yeah. Mm, all right. Say. Hmm. What? Uh, nope. Keeping it to myself. Yourself um, off. Great. Perfect. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick it up after the uh, broadcast. Mm -hmm. Next up is JR right below Fabio. YouTube's getting oh a lot better. Oh, go. JR. Sorry. Yeah. WWE joke there. He asks, you said in a recent Q&A that maintenance volume is much lower than previously suggested. Don't quote me, but something like with one third, even as low as one sixteenth. Uh, so it's one third to one ninth, um, but very close. Does that change your stance on volume during cutting? Meaning, do you still recommend going from MEV up to close to MRV? Or were you only referring to maintenance volume at maintenance calories? Uh, only at maintenance calories, yes. So as your cut progresses, 
your maintenance volume goes up a lot because the anabolic drive it takes to make you not lose muscle on the other end from the catabolic drive of the diet needs to be really high. At the end of a diet, especially a hardcore one, you come close to MRV for your normal training, even on a mass phase, just to keep the muscle on your body. So yeah, I would still train from MEV up to close to MRV in a cut because a few weeks into a cut, those start to look very similar. And at the end of a cut, they start to look like almost the same number. Yeah, and that's a big mistake people make. I'm not accusing you of making it, JR. But a lot of people will say like, well, I, I just train in maintenance for the cut. Like, yes, isocaloric maintenance during an unbelievably catabolic time, not the same thing. You could be off by you know, 15 sets per muscle group per week or something like that. James, have you, any, uh, have you had experience with clients getting this get wrong or anything like that before? Or? Yeah, there's been kind of like maybe, and maybe we're perpetuating this in some way, but there's kind of this notion of like, well, if you're doing a cut, then maybe you could do like kind of easier training. Like you don't have to do like super, super duper MRV training. And yeah, that might be true, but it's also more of a gamble that you're doing at the same time. So at that point, it's like, do like, re, you know, as what Mike and I would call like reasonable auto-regulated training where you feel like you're definitely getting some pump, some disruption, some stimulus, and it's probably should be above your maintenance calorie maintenance volumes for sure during a cut. If you're, if you're, do, if you're doing the, op, the other direction where you're just trying to do like as little training as possible during your cut, it kind of begs the bigger question of like, why are you doing this at all? Like why? Yeah. Go ahead, get and in there. It, yeah. If it can save you a lot of fatigue, cool. But if you lose muscle on a cut at the end of the cut, you can regain it. But at the end of the cut, you don't look that great. So for example, if you have to put yourself on a bodybuilding stage the, or transformation photo, hot dog body transformation. Yes. You want to end up on the slightly the side of maybe doing a little too much and then having to manage a little bit too much fatigue versus doing too little and then but you can manage and you keep the muscle, but if you lose the muscle, then it takes a few weeks to get it back. And then you just will look sort of deflated. Yeah. And our point on the, like this, this thing on maintenance volume being lower than we think it, it seems to just our, our bar for maintenance volume just keeps to seemingly drop over the years is that kind of the point being is that once you gain muscle and it's stuck around for a minute, it's pretty hard for you to really lose it on like a permanent scale. It's one of those things where like, if you gain the muscle, you don't have to do a whole lot to keep it outside of like just not training and dieting to lose weight really hard. Other than that, even if you do lose it, it seems like it comes back really, really easily. So more often than not, if you are trying to reduce your training loads for fatigue management purposes, you can go pretty low and not have to worry. Like, am I losing a little bit of size on my delts this week? Like, probably not. Did you do something? Did you like pick up a backpack or, you know, write something on a on a piece of paper, you're probably good. Yeah. All right. Next up, just below JR, is Daniel Mockin. Mm. He says, hey, Doc, so we want to tackle well. Adam Swink, who can hit we'll, we'll get, more we, we, we'll, we will actually, it's on the list. It's on the list. That's, <laughs> uh, that's an easy one. Uh, so Daniel asks, hey, Doc, hope you're both doing well. I was wondering well, what I could do the following week if I miss a few training sessions during the current week, if that makes sense. I'm currently in a massing phase and I train frequency six days a week due to work and other life commitments. Sometimes I struggle to get my frequency and therefore volume for the week. For example, I may do two to three weeks of really good training. Then the following week, I only train three or four times a week. I was wondering what I could do the next week to get back on track. Uh, would I use the previous week as a mini deload? Would I redo the previous week or just pick up where I left from last week. Would love to hear your recommendations on this topic. Thanks uh, both in advance. So actually the, the recommendation is generally pretty simple. You have to modify your plan. And the way the modification works is the following. For days that you actually successfully hit, you move on to that day next week. For days that you didn't hit, you do what you were supposed to last week, but didn't. That means your days get mixed up, but really it's all the same exercises and everything. You just alter the set numbers and alter the uh, rep targets, and they, there you go. Um, if you miss more than one week, it opens up a bit of a fractal of things you could be doing. Uh, the best recommendation is to not get yourself in the situation and, and actually just only do four or five days a week consistently. Um, you could also have, so that you don't get into the situation where you miss days all the time, you have to fuck with it. Another one is to have um, a, a kind of like a baseline plus floating schedule where you have a baseline schedule of shit you have to hit four days a week, must hit. 
And then if you have extra volume that week that you can spare because of time, you have two options workouts you can insert at the end of that week. So if you know your week coming up, it's like, ooh, okay, I have two more, uh, one lower body, one upper body session that I do Friday, Saturday, because I have the time. But if it's coming up Friday, Saturday, you don't, you just hit your baseline week. Um, no need to do anything super complicated and really altering your program, et cetera. But honestly, my best advice is don't get yourself into that situation. Pick a baseline plan you can stick to or a baseline plan with optional floating workouts to add in. And then you don't have to feel like you're backtracking all the time. James? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what I would do with my clients, um, if this is like a once in a mezzo kind of like, ah, something came up, it's not something that happens like every other week. It's just like, ah, you know, I had a sh shit week, something came up. More often than not, I'll just say, just, just do the same workouts in the same order that you would normally do it. And now your schedule is just going to be a little mixed up from what you normally do and just go from there. It's not a big deal. You know, it's basically is taking one of the weeks that you would have done. And instead of having it be one week, it ends up being a little bit longer than that. And uh, you kind of reorder the days of your workout. And at the end of the day, it's really not a big deal. I think it, the, the, the bigger issue, which Mike hit on and totally nailed is if this is something that happens very regularly, like this is like every two or three weeks kind of thing, then you need to back off from six days per week and just pick a schedule that you can do reliably and consistently. And then you can just take those. So instead of doing six days a week, maybe you just switch to four times a week and then you just get after it on those four days a little bit harder. And when I say a little bit harder, I just mean, you know, um, not training to failure or anything like that. Just meaning like, yeah, you maybe add some exercises and fill in that missing training stimuli that you would have gotten on the six days a week. And I think you're probably better off doing that from a consistency standpoint over time than getting into these uh, kind of like juggling mesos uh, month to month kind of situation. So I think Dr. Mike nailed it there. And and um, this is not meant to be insulting in any way. I, I understand completely. We've had a lot on this podcast. Yeah, um, I get that shit comes up. There is something to be said about discipline, right? Where if it is important to you and you want to make it happen and you've committed to six times a week, fucking do it. And then don't come back later and say like, oh, I had this like really bad homework assignment or whatever. Like, yeah, shit happens. Do it anyway. And if it's really bad, if you have legitimate things that come up that are disruptive in your life, like maybe you uh, are uh, a new parent and you have to deal with kids, or maybe you're dealing with um, you know, a sick family member, any of those things, understandable, pick to a schedule that you can commit to. But there's always going to be things in your way. So at some point, you do kind of have to bite down on your, your gum shield, as they would say in England, and uh, just get her done, you know, and just be disciplined about it. When, when motivation fails, you got to lean on that discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Next up, Adam Swink asks, who can hip thrust more, Mike or James? Well, <laughs> my best hip thrust ever was, I think, like 185 for a set of 10. And I was like, this exercise is done with rocks. I'm fucking done with it. I believe James has done a lot more. James? I have done more, but it's one of those. It's kind of like leg press. Like, it, I don't like the numbers don't even register to me as like, it's just like, what you know, whatever. I, that's, I just hip thrusted 255 or whatever. You know, it's like. Who cares? It's one of those weird exercises. Normally when it's like, who's stronger, Mike or James? I mean, 95% of the time, maybe even more, it's Mike by a long shot. I remember, so um, Mike and I had a colleague, we call him Coach Tim uh, at ETSU. He was a weightlifter. He was one of the weightlifting coaches, actually. A motherfucker looked like Thor. He was Jack. He, was he had a very so soft-spoken voice. So he'd be like, hi, my name's Tim. Um, and I used to try and compete with Tim because he was like a strong guy. And the only thing I could compete with Tim on was deadlifts. And him and I would go like toe to toe on deadlifts. But then he would squat like 405 for a set of 10. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm working on ah, 275 over here. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, strength competition. I am not your man. But hip thrust is one of those like silly ones, too, where it's like it doesn't matter. It's like leg press. Like some people are just really strong at leg press. Other people aren't. It's okay. All right. Next up, believe it or not, is Frank Sinatra. Whoa. The one and only Frank Sinatra reborn to ask questions. All right. Frank says, dear good doctor, something very serious has occurred and your help is most definitely needed. I cannot get a fucking pump in the good old days. I used to get the most mind bending pumps, skin tearing, arms floating away, systemic capillary orgasms. Very beautiful. But it's been three years since I've been able to get a decent pump. All the boxes have been duly checked. Massive extended caloric surplus. 
800 gram carbs, deloads, long deloads, periodization, good mind muscle connection, hydration, ramen noodles, <laughs> heavy weights, light weights, full ROM, partial ROM, even watching pumping iron while doing pack flies. That's a really uh, typical oh, fear. Oh, oh my God. No matter the workout or type of conditions, this doesn't happen anymore. Coincidentally, I've also not grown one spec since the pumps left. I've been training for eight years. I have even fled with my adrenal cortices to make sure they're on top of their aldosterone game. Not sure if they listened. Am I just over the hill? Is 26 simply too old to achieve new robust pumps? Yeah, 26 uh, makes you're me done. You're so done. If you were 46, yeah, if you were 46, I'd be like, you're just becoming an old man. Uh, 26 is real, real, very, very too young to do this. So I'm lots of confused, feel the only very purpose of the gym is slipping through my cold fingers. Mm, yeah. Dot, dot, yeah. dot. So I would say uh, my, so you, you actually ran through all the recommendations I was going to say, um, uh, including deloading and long deloading usually gets the pumps going. I would go and get comprehensive blood work to make sure everything's uh, fine in that regard. That's probably my first recourse there. Uh, sorry, but that would be what I would tell a client or something. James. Yeah, I would. Uh, and maybe, maybe this is just a, a semantics thing, but I would do a kind of a hard reset on training. I would take like three weeks just off no training period, like no training at all. And if you come back after yeah. not lifting at all for three weeks and can't get a pump, like something's not go to the doctor, right. yeah. go to the doctor. I mean, I know it sucks. Sorry. Trust me. This is like the last thing I would want to say is like, don't lift for three weeks, but that's what I would call like a hard reset where it's like at that point, if, if your MEV is not like two sets, like something's up. Yeah, 100%. Next up is I mean, Christina. Is watching Sorry. pumping iron while he's lifting. What more can you ask God. for? So, folks, shout out to um, Das Gym in Austria. They have one of the most fun gym setups I have ever experienced oh, yeah. in my life. In addition to just being a great facility with lots of great equipment and great staff and great just um, nostalgia of the gym all around. They'll have like on one Megatron over here, they'll have like a, a DVD of like Metallica playing live. And over here, so, they'll have like trip. videos of like Ronnie Coleman or Arnie doing workout training, you know, pumping up. And so it's like you're 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 there pumping up and you're watching them pump up and there's music and oh my God, what a setting. It's a trip, man. Uh, I, I, yeah. Wow. I didn't know what to do when I first got to the gym. It's it's like a gym and a museum in the same place. It is. It is. They have a whole bunch of like memorabilia from all these different action movie stars and stuff. If you're ever kind of like in the Vienna area, it's worth a trip over there because it's a great facility to train at, first of all. And it's just like, it's kind of like an amusement park for fitness people. It's really fun. All right. Next up is Christina. C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A. Oh, yeah. and this one is off somewhere else. Sorry. There we go. Uh, excuse me. All right. Hello. Oh, all right. Christina asks, hi, docs. I was wondering about how much running slash endurance training you get away with before it starts to interfere with hypertrophy and strength gains. Mm. I'm a former long distance runner, but I got burned out and switched my focus to weightlifting. I still want to incorporate running and mountain biking in my training schedule because of cardiovascular benefits and high total daily energy expenditure. But these are my preferred vessels of cardio. Oh, and these are my preferred vessels of cardio. At the moment, I run around two times per week for 30 to 45 minutes. And heart rate zones two to four. Mountain biking is more around once per week uh, or two weeks at about one to two hours predominantly in zone one. I'm okay with small interference, say 80% of normal gains. I'd say that's pretty big interference, but no worries. <laughs> I don't want to bust my ass in the gym for half the results because of cardio. I already... Split cardio and weightlifting for more than six hours between, or just my off days of lifting. As recommended per the science I've read, however, I didn't find any concrete numbers on how much percentage with cardio interferes. That they don't exist. You can stop looking for them whenever you whenever you like, um, because it would be so individually specific and context specific. It wouldn't even be an answer. It's hard to how much interferes with hypertrophy and strength gains. Would love to know your opinions about this topic. So what I would do is I would say you continue to do the cardio you're doing now and monitor your rate of gains and lifting. And I would up the cardio just marginally at another session of running and another session of cycling. Give it a month or two, see how your lifting is treating you. If you can tell yourself, man, I'm definitely feeling this fucking cardio and the results are not as good, back, back off. If you increase the cardio and everything's fucking golden, stay there or increase again. Sooner or later, you will find when the lifting really takes a hit. And the, here's the good news. And we've already answered a similar question earlier. As soon as you back away from cardio and lift a little bit more and, and recover more and eat more, you'll get all your gains that you lost back if you lose any gains or if your gains slow down, they will speed back up as soon as you pare down on the cardio. So because 
you're not asking us a question just out of the blue. You already do some cardio. You're in a really good position to have a baseline already. And you know you're good with these results. Increase cardio just a little. See if you're still good with the results and go from there. Because we can tell you like, oh, X, Y, Z, in our experience, blah, blah, blah. Individual variation eats all that up. So um, I wouldn't even want to give that answer. Maybe James can give a general answer, but I would say that's my shit for now. Yeah, no, that, yeah. Was a, that was a great response. Um, so a couple couple things, and this is just me being cunty, sorry. So my response will differ depending on whether you meant weightlifting one word or weightlifting two words, because that actually changes it significantly. Um, if you, and this is, again, me being cunty, but if you are doing weightlifting one word, then the cardio stuff that you're doing will have a more distinct interference effect, mm -hmm. right? Versus if you're just doing like hypertrophy or strength training, that will not be as profound as if it was, was weightlifting one word. Um, so that being said, um, either way, the amount of interference that you get from this stuff is, is directly proportional to how much of each that you're doing. It goes kind of in both directions, more so on the side of endurance interferes with gains from resistance training than the other direction, but it does go both ways. And so kind of the short answer is the more running and more endurance stuff you do, the more potential for interference effects. What are the magnitude of those effects? Oh my God, they're so small. It's really insignificant for somebody who's just trying to live a fit and healthy lifestyle. I mean, we're not even talking, she gave the example of like 80% of normal gains. Dude, we're, we're talking like 97.5% of normal gains, unless you're doing a shitload to the point where, as Mike said, you can tell, like, I got no juice in my legs. I can't even hit an overloading stimulus for this training session. That's when you start running into more substantial interference effects. But if you're not running into that, we're talking very, very, very minute things. I have a client who is um, probably very much like yourself. She likes to do mountain biking. She does snowshoeing. She does skiing, snowboarding. Uh, I don't think she runs, but she does a lot of these endurance kind of type activities and she does a full, full on hypertrophy program. The thing is like, if you are a type one person, and if you have been gravitating towards cardio activities, most of your life, you're probably more of that type one style. You're not going to be making huge gains on the resistance side anyway. And your systemic and local MRVs are so high. It's like a drop in the bucket. So in this case, it's like, could you be doing more resistance training? Yeah, probably. Are you going to be making like that much more gains if you did? No. <laughs> so you might as right. well just what you want anyway. Um, yes. And that's what my client in this instance, and, and we actually had a, a, a talk. I've been working with this person for years and, you know, kind of did the normal, like, Hey, if you want to be really jacked, like you got to put more effort into the stuff that makes you jacked and listen to this other stuff. And then she finally came back to me and said, you know, Hey, we've been kind of doing this for a while and I'm really happy with how things have gone. But these other things like doing the mountain biking and snowshoeing and skiing and all that stuff really makes me happy. And I want to keep that more part of my life just because I enjoy it so much. And I said, yeah, that makes perfect sense, of course. And so she just does more of that. We do a little bit less weight training and guess what? She makes roughly the same progress that she was making before anyway. So like, just go for it. If it makes yeah. you happy, it's not a big deal. Yeah, I totally agree. Last is Terran, Terangar Productions. Terangar, T-E-R-A-N. Oh, there it is. What is that? Is that an orangutan? What is that avatar? Yeah, I assume it is. All right. The question today is, last question for us, by the way. Hi, Dr. Mike, Dr. James. I'm calculating protein intake for building muscle. Should you use your current body weight, whatever that may be, or should you use lean body weight? Thanks in advance. So it depends on what number you're using. If you use numbers from studies that are calculated off lean body mass, use those. They tend to be lower. If you use numbers from studies calculated on total body mass, use those. With one caveat, and the caveat is if you are very, very fat, uh, sorry, that's a very mean way to say it. Uh, if you're over 20 to 30% body fat as a male or 30 to 40% as a female, then what you might wanna do is make a choice. You can eat the gram per pound or whatever, but that'll be a lot of protein. The downside is it's a lot of protein and it's some extra for sure. You don't need to grow muscle. The upside is uh, people who tend to be that fat often have appetite issues. That is, they have excessive appetite. And that extra amount of protein can actually zap that shit and then it's better. So for fat yes. loss diets, one really hilarious complaint to hear from folks 
who are very over fat is, oh, I can't eat all this food on a diet. Like, motherfucker, I don't doubt that you can eat the food. Nobody doubt that shit. Like, but from a more compassionate place, like it can be annoying to eat extra protein when a diet of more veggies or carbs would be better and less protein. What I would say is if you're relatively lean, under 20% fat for male, under 30 for female, I would go with a per body weight number is no problem, grab per pound. If you want to get extra persnickety, you can always use the LBM reference numbers from various meta-analyses. And if you're over fat by a considerable margin, I would pick a number between those two, or sorry, between what your, you know, say 300 pounds, should you eat 300 grams of protein, your LBM is only 200 pounds, but maybe you eat uh, anywhere between those two is fine, fine answer. You can eat as little as 200, but I would start with like 250, somewhere between the two and uh, see how your uh, quality of life and diet choices and annoyance of paying money for and eating and chewing a bunch of protein go. And if you like it, then 250 is great. Even 300 is great. Uh, and if you don't like it, then go closer to 200 and you may find uh, better, find not better results, but better ability to adhere to them and enjoy them. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one of, and I, I use this word lightly, but one of the common complaints, it's not really a complaint, it's more of just an observation for people who start at RP when they're doing a weight loss diet. One of the first things we hear all the time is like, God, I feel like I'm eating so much. And it's like, because they're not used to eat, because most people, you know, for a meal, they might just have some like spaghetti, you know, or like mm -hmm. some string cheese or something. So they're not used to actually eating like Fish a substantial crackers. amount of protein, crackers. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so then you start putting them on like three ounces or four ounces of protein per meal four to six times a day. And they're like, oh, what the fuck is this? I don't want to eat anymore. I don't even want to eat all these carbs. And you're like, this is a good problem. Remember this moment about uh, 10 weeks from now, you might be singing a different tune, but yeah. enjoy it while it lasts. But sometimes it is super annoying. So you can lower the protein if you like, and then raise it later when you get more hungry. Absolutely. That's it. I felt like that was a quick one. We ripped through those today. I guess, yeah, these, these were the top questions. It was a very well-watched episode and everything. It's just, sometimes the questions are just more in-depth than maybe even the questions that are sometimes in-depth can be answered quickly. And sometimes maybe we just didn't rant long enough. I don't know. Maybe we're just that damn good. Um, so, Mike, any RP or Dr. Mike or any other housekeeping items? What's going on? Anything interesting? Follow me on Instagram. Dr. Mike is Rattel on Instagram. I'm no longer RP Dr. Mike. Mm, it's a new one. Let's see. Do I yeah. have anything going on? Still trying to get my old account back, but the chances of that are incrementally falling. Ugh, that's such a bummer. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, just I, I always have secret projects. I can't talk about them. Yeah, yes. no. Which is why every time you bring up this, like, uh, do you have any announcements? I'm always like, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, you always have like videos and stuff that are always coming out. That's sure, why sure. Like, your videos are always super popular. So. Sure. But then the announcement's like, we got videos coming out. Well, I will say we recorded a bunch of videos for the holiday period. So we got a lot of really good holiday there videos go. coming out. Some contentious subjects, even involving anabolics. Ooh. Anabolic Santa. Pretty sweet. He brings you gains or he's just really jacked or both. He needs all insulin from all those cookies that he's pounding. He like gets down the chimney ultra quick because he's having a like hypoglycemic episode. He's like, ah, 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 sweating like crazy. You're like, Santa, are you okay? He's like, oh, the fuck are you? He's like, let him renorm. It'll take five minutes. He'll be fine. Oh my God. All right, folks. Great questions as always. Um, just a reminder, if you guys want to submit a question, you can post it on the most recent Q&A with uh, Mike and James. And what we uh, usually recommend, you, yeah, this one. And uh, we usually recommend that you just kind of give it a quick scroll through on the comments because somebody might have posted some comments that you actually think are pretty interesting. And if you do find those, give them an upvote. We saw uh, we have some some consistent deliverers, Henrik Anderson, mm -hmm. Mister Forty Four, this week. Very good. Um, so you're welcome to post any questions you want. We're going to take the top ten, either most upvoted is what we usually go to, or if we just happen to see one that's particularly spicy, we'll grab that too. Yeah. But usually we do top ten. So thanks again for submitting your questions. Keep upvoting other people's pay it forward and we will see you next time.